lungs. It's evidence of fluid. They're so consolidated, it looks like her liver. It's consistent with the flu and with the lung damage of the other three victims who are on this table. That's why I think the cause of death is flu or cancer. If it wasn't the flu, it would have been eventually. Let's open her skull just to make sure. Surgical area looks normal. No indication the tumor eroded into the brain vessels. Or increased pressure to herniate her brainstem. I'll have to check the lung samples to be sure, but I'm betting cause of death is the flu. Forceps. What do you see? Radiation pellet. Her oncologist must have been using radiation implants to try to cure her cancer. Wait a second. There's several of them in there. You thinking what I'm thinking? Besides attacking the cancer, the radiation was strong enough to mutate the flu virus into a more aggressive, virulent form. Michelle Carpenter is the source of the mutation. I'll have to run the tests. But that's my call. Mutation, we don't know how to stop. Natalie's test proves the cancer victim, Michelle Carpenter, was most likely the source of the viral mutation. And being good Samaritans, the doctor, the grocer, and the lawyer, all caught it from her as they stopped in to check on her. Yeah, and then they went out and spread it all over town. All right, so we know what this thing is and where it came from, but we still don't know how to stop it. History proves that nature is random. Influenza's rise and then vanish just as quickly. Well, luckily, we have this one contained. Are you sure about that? Well, no one left Deering who was infected. We retraced the three men's steps and all the people they had direct contact with. And? And they're all here. We're missing something. <laughs> A single mother takes her kids shopping at the end of an exhausting day. going above and beyond gets infected trying to help others. A couple that's taking care of a man literally from cradle to grave could end up losing their lives. It's been right in front of us the whole damn time. What? Stanley Price had close contact with William Goldman since the moment he got sick to the time that he died. He said the guy even puked in his truck. Okay. His wife comes back from visiting her sister. She had limited exposure to Goldman, yet she got sick. Doesn't make sense, does it? Stanley's the frailest, oldest person in there. Why didn't Stanley get sick? So, Stanley, tell me about your life. You're looking at it. At least this last 67 years. How you feeling? I ain't feeling sick, if that's what you're asking. I mean, during your life. Tell me about your history of illness. Well, for a man my age, I've been lucky, I guess. Coughs, colds, the usual thing everybody has. Suffered a bit with glaucoma, arthritis in the hands, prostate ain't worth a damn. Left knee's been hurting since 1968. How about as a child? Well, measles, mumps, chicken pox, the usual. Mama said I was very sick, though, when I was only two. Did she say what kind of sickness it was? Something bad swept through. Said she thought she was gonna lose me because everybody that had the same thing were dying. Stanley, were you born before 1918? Two years. 
I arrived April 1st, 1916. That's why Iris calls me foolish. Born on April Fool's Day. In Iris? She's younger than you. Five years. Born in 21. That means something? Natalie, test Stanley Price's blood. I already have. Do it again. This time, don't run it for flu virus. Test it for flu antibodies. Antibodies? Mr. Price? He was exposed as a child to the 1918 pandemic. The Spanish flu? And he's the only person with repeated exposure to this mutated virus that doesn't show any of the symptoms. I'll call you back. Connor. You were right. Stanley's blood has the antibodies. <sighs> Stanley. You ever flown in a helicopter? What? I need you to go to our lab in Bethesda. I can't do that. I can't leave Iris. Especially now. Stanley, you may be the only one that can save her life. What are you doing? Well, Mr. Price, this machine's gonna help me take several units of your blood plasma from which we'll strip your antibodies, purify them, then introduce them into the other victims as a form of passive immunity to the virus. We'll then immortalize your lymphocytes, the part of your white blood cells that are manufacturing the antibodies to the virus, so they can be used again in other patients as a form of passive immunization. Do you know what she's saying? It's like chicken pox or the measles, how once you get them, you almost never get them again. This flu virus is close enough to the one that you were exposed to as a child that there's stuff in your blood that fights it. Dr. Duran is going to take some of it out and give it to Iris and the other people who are sick, and hopefully it'll make them get better. Exactly. Three vials, that's all? Natalie busted her ass to produce this much. She said she'd have gallons in 48 hours. We don't have 48 hours, and that's not enough for everyone. Producing antibodies usually takes much longer. We're lucky to have this much anti-serum. Lucky for whom? For those who get to live. Which brings us to the harsh realities of rationing it. Are you with me, Miles? Yeah. Rationing, I don't like the term nor the concept. We treat the most patients we can with the anti-serum we have. Who gives us the right to decide who gets it? Who gives us the right to play God? This isn't about God or morals. It's about being doctors. Our job is to compartmentalize our emotions and rationally save as many patients as possible. And how do we decide who they are? By being dispassionate scientists. Look, we know there are those patients in there with low viral loads that will survive until the next batch of anti-serum. That's the easy choice to exclude. And then there are those in there who are too far gone to save. Patients that we could give it all to and they still won't survive. It's the ones in the middle that we give this to. And we just ignore every other factor. Like what? Like age. Lilith is 24 years old. She has her entire life ahead of her. And I'm sorry, but Mrs. Price is in her 80s. And at best, we buy her a few extra years. We can't triage based on potential life expectancy or quality of contribution in society. That only leads to passing judgment on the value of someone's life. Why do we ignore a value that's so real? Because we work with finites, facts, measurable quantities, because we triage based on medical necessity alone. Look, you've monitored the progression of this illness through these patients more than anyone. You make the call. No, 
You should keep that on. It messes up my hair. It's hot out here. There's not enough medicine to go around. No. Make sure Emily's boys get some. They will. Lilith. I'm not afraid, Miles. You gotta be a good doctor. As soon as you start looking a little older. You tell your parents you love them. Before it's too late. Her fever's come down, and her lungs are clearing. So, uh, she's gonna be, um, okay? She needs plenty of rest, but yes, I believe she's gonna make a full recovery. Don't look so surprised, foolish old man. Good work, Miles. Doesn't feel like it. You ever wonder why I'm such a son of a bitch at times? Me and everyone else. When I was about your age, I could figure out any disease they showed me. I was young, invincible, filled with promise. And pride. And then someone very dear to me came down with a bacterial infection in their lungs. It defied everything the doctors threw at it. So I flew home. I told the doctors, I can fix this. I had to save this one person. But I couldn't. See, nature doesn't care about how much training we've had, or how smart we think we are. Nature doesn't give a damn. So my advice to you is this. Either learn how to deal with it, or quit. But I think you're too good of a doctor to walk away from this. Dr. Connor? Thank you. You're welcome. Ready to go? Yeah, I'll be with you in a minute. Hey, Dad, it's Miles. Listen, I'm thinking about coming home for a visit. <laughs> 